Welcome to episode nine of the WINS Live interview series. I'm Amy Sheridan, host and founder of WINS Media. The mission of this series is to elevate the visibility of women in sports and entertainment by creating a connected environment for authentic storytelling. Thank you for joining us as we interview influential leaders across sports, entertainment, and beyond. Today, I have the fabulous and talented Raven Jemison with me. Very, very, very excited. Hi, Amy. Hi, and thank you. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Sure. Raven is the EVP of Business Operations for the Milwaukee Bucks and Pfizer Forum. In her role, which she's really just getting started with, she enjoys the responsibility of maximizing cross-departmental revenues while integrating the Bucks, Pfizer Forum, the Deer District, and the G League Wisconsin Herd into the Milwaukee community. She's an advocate for human rights, a champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace, a believer in sports as a vehicle for change, and the proud owner of an irrationally large sneaker collection. Um, and so welcome, Raven. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I really want to get into the questions with you. I have so many, you know, so much that I want to talk to you about. But okay. first, as promised, um, please give us a little bit of a look into your shoe collection. I heard that you have a new one. I, I'm constantly trying not to have new ones, but I don't, I don't always abide by it. <laughs> but I did just get, I did just get one yesterday and I hope that this is a first on the webinar series. I'm, I'm willing to say it's a first. I'm gonna do an unboxing if that's okay. It is okay. so okay, I'm so excited. Okay. All right, so I just got these yesterday. Um, they are the Jordan 1 High. They're called the Patina. I don't know if you can wow. see them. Well. They're called the Patina, but it's also known as the Rust Shadow. So Patina, if you think about what it means it's essentially an it's a surface it, it's a green or brown film on a surface like any type of metal and it's produced by oxidation so the shoe and it looks kind of like rust on metal so that's why it's called the jordan one high patina because it kind of looks rusty so can see just a little just a little history there so i i i am what you probably call like a sneaker nerd not necessarily like a sneaker head um, who just collects shoes and, and gets the sneaker with all the hype. I like to know a little bit about the history and like what, you know, what Nike in particular, because I do Nike Jordan 1s and Nike Air Max 1s and what Nike is thinking with respect to the different colorways. So um, I'm probably more of a nerd than anything else. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, uh, it's an obsession and I am trying to recover or be a recovering sneaker. <laughs> nerd, but I, I don't, I don't know that I'll ever recover. That's for sure. But tell us, so you shared the fun fact with me about how actually large your collection was and, and what you actually yeah. did with it. Can you share that with us? Yeah. So back in the day, I was kind of someone who just collected shoes because I worked at a, a sporting goods store and it was during college and I just started collecting shoes. I was never really wearing them because you get a discount obviously in the sporting goods store. And as I started getting into my professional career, I started having less and less space for the sneakers. So I just had a uh, storage unit that I would put the sneakers in and just never wear them. Um, it came to when I was getting ready to get married, actually, that I, or I won't say getting married, maybe that's not the breast barometer. When I was starting to really think about how my money was being spent and how I could actually make more money. Um, and I thought, oh, I have all these sneakers in this storage unit. What can I do with them? And this was around the time of the height of resale, right? And when, you know, StockX and GOAT were starting to explode on the scene. So I was like, let me go just visit the storage unit. This was like eight years ago, seven, eight years ago. And I go in and there's a lot of sneakers. Um, I won't say the number. And I pull out one and one of the sneakers that I pulled out had come back already. So I was like, let's just give it a shot. So I just started posting them and reselling them and they helped to pay for my wedding. So that awesome. that's kind of the, the fun fact by accident 
if you will. I love it. <laughs> sure. I love it. I mean, it's because how do you, how do you wear all those sneakers? You know, I mean, do you wear a different pair every single day? I, I don't. Um, I'm fortunately out of, I won't say corporate America, but at the league, we were kind of corporate. Um, mm-hmm. I just came from the league office, the NBA league office, and I couldn't wear them as much as I wanted to, but I have been able to wear them a little bit here in Milwaukee, which has been nice. Um, and I anticipate being able to wear them a little bit more in my day to day. But I, I definitely wear them mostly to go on errands to like Home Depot or the grocery <laughs> store um, when it's not COVID. Um, but, you know, always try to look at least somewhat put together um, during COVID. Life. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, real life. Absolutely. Wear, wear them to Home Depot. For sure. Home Depot. Okay. So thank you for sharing all that. Happy to. So let's get into your mindset a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you have a, a long history of roles in sports and entertainment. You have taken a journey to get to where you are today. And the last role you were at, you, you were in was at the National Basketball Association in New York mm-hmm. um, on the team book team, right? How many years were you at the NBA? Six years. Okay. Yeah. So now you find yourself in Milwaukee as the EVP of business operations, an incredible opportunity. Absolutely. Do you mind telling us just the story of how this opportunity presented itself to you? And, and that really leads into your mindset and how you've handled your career to date. But how did this opportunity present itself? Well, I should probably back up a bit to explain what my role was at the league. Um, I was in our Teambo group. And for those that don't know, Teambo stands for team marketing, business, team marketing and business operations. So if you think about traditional consulting firms, your Baines, your McKinsey's, um, we were the in-house consulting group for the league. So what we would do is work with our teams across the NBA, G League, WNBA and our 2K league to help teams maximize business potential. And what that means is you essentially have accounts, which are teams that you try to become a strategic partner for, right? You don't want to really be an ivory tower consultant where you say, Hey, do this, do that without any consultation or consideration of costs to do things. So you really need to get into the business operations to be able to talk to a team president or a team CEO to help them buy into what you're trying to sell, so to speak. So my role gave me exposure to different team presidents, of course, and towards the end, I was an NBA account manager for six teams, but I was also on a project working with a team president that was kind of our, I'll call him our advisor um, for the project that we were on as COVID hit and we were trying to think about how we get back into the buildings for the 21-22 season, or I'm sorry, the 2021 season. And that team president happened to be Peter Fagan, who is the president of the Milwaukee Bucks. So as we just developed relationship um, and rapport with each other, I guess you could say he appreciated the way I worked, the way I thought. Um, And he was looking for a number two at at Pfizer Forum and the Milwaukee Bucks. um, Because, of course, if you know, the arena had just been built and then COVID hit. The team's playing great and then everything just kind of stopped. So he wanted to use this as an opportunity to really think more strategically around business operations as a whole and how we can actually grow the business um, in a significant way year over year. So he wanted the number two to focus on these types of opportunities and initiatives. And we just hit it off. And I guess a few months after we just had the first conversation, uh, I ended up here in Milwaukee with three feet of snow banks alongside the sidewalk. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I remember talking to you before you took the step and mm-hmm. then after uh, and a lot of good vibes coming from the new role. So congrats. Yeah. Thank it's you. A Thank really you. Really amazing opportunity and position that you have. Absolutely. And so talk a little bit about, you know, your journey, right? So you mm-hmm. landed this role and yep. you, it, it did help that you had opened a facility before right? Which I think was probably a defining part of your journey. Um, Mm -hmm. But in your opinion, you know, how throughout your journey did you establish and maintain your reputation in this business to get where you are today? That's a really good question. Um, So we talked a little bit about leadership and you'd asked this question before hitting on this one. Um, maybe how I think about my leadership and it's probably best to maybe ask those who I've led, but I would say 
that I try to be fair. Um, I try to be empathetic. Um, and I also try to lead with integrity. Uh, but I'd say most, I, I try to be humble, probably sometimes too much I hear. Um, and in too much of also a, a self-deprecating way, I know what I don't know, right? I, I try to surround myself with people who are much smarter than me and who can add value in ways that I can't. Um, so to now answer your current question, because I think that matters um, with respect to how I lead, it's how I lead comes from how I've been able to maintain uh, the reputation I have in this business. And it's essentially because I'm intellectually curious and those that hopefully work alongside me can appreciate that because I'm always asking why. And in this new role, I get to ask why a lot because I'm still technically new, but I really want to make sure that when I'm doing what I'm doing, that there's purpose. So I did learn early in life that you can't just do something because someone asks you to. Um, I will say, unless you're the child of a Southern mother, like I am, I was raised in the South and you should probably not talk back and just do what she says. But when it comes to being in business, particularly one as competitive as sports business, I just tried to lean in and learn why and how something was done. So why do we sell tickets this way? Um, why do companies want to do business, business with us and why should they? Um, I feel like I've always needed to have a purpose in what I'm doing so I can then know how I can add value. And if I'm not asking those types of questions, no matter what level I was in, I kind of felt lost with respect to what I was doing. So I would say that's probably been the main thing that I've tried to lean on. It's just that intellectual curiosity. Uh, and I say all that to say that anybody listening, don't wait for someone to teach you the business or don't wait for someone to mentor you so you can learn the business. Um, I would just recommend that you take control of your growth and development, proactively ask questions of your leaders, and do what you need to do to learn how you can add value. Um, and then lastly, to me, this is the reason why I'm here today, without a doubt, is I followed the money. Um, selling and knowing how to generate revenue got me where I am today, without a doubt. Um, without my sales experience, I probably would not be here today, but also my selling myself, because you'll hear the term up and comers, which I'm not really that big a fan of. Um, but you'll hear that. And sometimes you need to sell yourself to be not an up and comer anymore, but someone who's actually arrived. And to do that, you have to be able to sell yourself as well. So um, even if you aren't directly selling a product um, in your current role, knowing how you contribute to the selling of a product. So for example, if you're in digital or marketing or you're in a content generation space, um, sometimes those departments get labeled as cost centers or they get labeled as non-revenue generating parts of the business. But the truth is, it's up to someone in that type of role to be able to craft the story of how brand building and content generation skills are actually impacting the bottom line because everybody contributes to making the organization money. It's just how you're selling that story um, to be able to continue to elevate in your career. So I would always say, first and foremost, follow the money and know how it's made. Yes, a lot of valid points there. Mm -hmm. Be curious. Okay, this comes up a lot, um, particularly with women who have strategically gone from one role to another to another to essentially conquer a skill that they don't know how to do, right? Yep. Yep. That comes up a lot. And so you develop this breadth of knowledge and these experiences that you carry from one thing to the next. And you've done an amazing job with that. Um, and of course, follow the money and in, in not, not just in sports and entertainment, but in so many businesses is if you can, if you're not directly attached to a revenue stream, be associated with a revenue stream and understand that and, mm -hmm. and understand how that works. And, and I loved your point about don't wait for someone to explain the business to you, you know, pick up your pencil and start writing. Uh, you know, I think that's one of the, you know, we can talk about this later, but one of the number one qualities that I know that when I worked in the industry proper that we looked for a self-starter, there's almost yes. only so many bodies. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to wait for someone to tell you what to do, then you're probably going to get overlooked for you know, that promotion yeah. and all that other stuff. So really yeah. great advice there. And, and I'll just add one, one last thing. Be really good at what you do. So I say that to say that too often, you know, I get the LinkedIn network request or I get the, hey, will you be my mentor? 
and I'm talking to them and I'm asking like, what are you currently doing in your role that says you're ready for the next step as an example, or how are you successful and what story can you tell so you can get that opportunity when you get into the room to say how you're adding value. And you'll hear me say that probably throughout this entire um, interview, adding value to me is period point blank, how you continue to stay in any industry, but in particular sports business, being kind of a utility player, if you will, and being able to adjust and be nimble um, is super, super important. And you do that and you can do that and be successful if you're adding value. But first, before you can talk about adding more responsibilities and before you can talk about getting a promotion, be really, really good at what you do. Be the best at what you do. So when you're adding value in your current role, you will be missed if for some reason you take a chance and you say, I need to be promoted. Not to say you want to give ultimatums, but there's a clear line in the sand where you're saying I'm ready and maybe the organization is not ready to give it to you. Then you can say, okay, well then I'm going to go find another opportunity for me where I can truly blossom and shine and grow my career. But it comes and that confidence comes by being really good at what you currently do. So then you can take a look out, you know, a couple of years out and say, okay, this is now what I want to accomplish. So don't want to diminish that point because a lot of the times we get people saying, I'm ready for the next step, but it's only because they've been in a role for two years. And that's the time that somebody last got promoted in that role, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And they know it all too well. It's a very competitive industry. It is. Right. Um, and at the team, of course, at the team level, there's not a ton of turnover. Right. So it's definitely about, yeah, how can you be the best? How can you add value? Taking something off your boss's plate, for example, what can I mm -hmm. do to help you do your job better? I think the concept of managing up, right? Yep. I'm going to make my boss look really, really good. Right. And so great point. <laughs> great point. You yep. know, I found that was really helpful a lot yep. <laughs> in sports is to really manage up and really focus on what is my boss prioritizing yep. and how can I make them look really yep. good in this, in this moment? Yeah. And that goes back to being intellectually curious right? Absolutely. What are you doing? Because I might want your job one day. So what are you focused on? And how can I learn more about that? And that goes back to just taking control of what it is you need to accomplish uh, to take that next step. Right. Okay. So okay, we're going backwards and forwards throughout the interview. Um, okay. You know, like a well-designed series on Netflix. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I call this little segment story time because Okay. Everybody has really great stories. And one that you shared with me was, you know, during the time that you were opening Levi Stadium and mm -hmm. leading the member services team. Yeah. I would love for you to share the story about, you know, you expressed this was one of the hardest things you had ever done. Of course, now you find yourself in a similar position, but in a different yep. role, you know, with a new venue in Milwaukee. But what made opening that venue so challenging and what were some of the defining moments in that role for you and your career? Okay. So every time I tell this story, and I think it even happened the last time we talked about this, I do get emotional. So I'm going to see if I can get through it without doing so today. Um, Cause I didn't think this was going to be a Barbara Walters type, type of interview, but it's fine. It's fine. So um, I'm not even sure I've told this in a public setting or that my team uh, my member services team that I was leading at the time knows this. Uh, but let me start by saying, if you ever get a chance to be a part of a new arena or stadium build, do it 1000%. Like, don't even question it. I took a lateral move uh, or a detour, if you will, on my career path to do it. And I would not trade it for the world. Because to your point, Amy, I wouldn't probably be here today um, without that experience. So I just want to start with that before I talk about the challenge, because it was definitely a positive, overall positive experience. That said, it was taxing, uh, both mentally and physically. Uh, two months prior, roughly two months prior to the stadium opening, I just reached my breaking point. Um, the amount of hours spent, countless hours talking to clients who were upset about one thing or another, you know, working with leadership to make sure that you know, what we were actually selling was actually going to be as part of the design and all that. Like I was having a rough time um, and I was questioning if I really wanted to be in sports. You know, I had friends who were doctors and engineers and teachers who were making a real impact on the world. And here I am selling tickets, you know, at the end of the day, not to diminish what I'm what I'm doing, but relatively speaking, 
you know, I, I was really hard on myself because I'm like, is this really what I want to do? Uh, my team was burned out. I was burned out. But, you know, as the leader, you try not to show it. You got to stay upbeat and you got to help them push through because it was challenging. Uh, the conversations were challenging and the hours were definitely tough. Um, and so I walked into the office one day. I sat down at my computer and I actually started typing my resignation letter. And it was almost like an out of body experience, even as I'm describing it right now, because I've never quit a job ever um, without another job in hand or another opportunity to elevate, you know, obviously within my career. And I don't even know if I've ever quit anything really um, that was, you know, good for me. Right. Um, so I had no plan. And as I'm typing this letter and like reading it, I hit print. And at that exact moment that I hit print, it's, it's every time I talk about it, it's just so interesting. The, the, the timing in walks my team with flowers and a bottle of wine to thank me. And it's roughly what, eight or nine of them at the time. They thanked me for leading them through the challenging times and being at that time, they were my biggest cheerleader when I needed them the most, which is odd to say that a leader needs a cheerleader. And of course, you know, I didn't quit, but this was a defining moment for me because it showed me that you don't always have to be perfect and strong, even though, you know, us as women, especially once you rise in your career, you feel like you have to have it all put together. Everything has to be perfect. Your responses, your poise, everything. Um, don't let them see you sweat, right? I think is the is the phrase. Um, and we always think we need to be those things. And the truth is we don't need to have answers for everyone. Uh, and a leader can be led. And in that moment, my team led me that day. They got me back on track. And I, I say that was a defining moment for the project, for me, my team, because it made me take a step back and say, one, it's okay to lean on others for support. Two, my team is as much in this as I am. And three, like we got a stadium, stadium to fill, finish and fill, right? So it was, a, it was just an interesting moment that one helped me to stay into sports and I think got me on the path to being the leader that I hope to be today. Um, when we talk about, you know, the empathy and leading with integrity and trying to do the work that maybe some leaders wouldn't do. Like I was in the trenches with my team getting yelled at and not saying, hey, you guys handle that. And when it gets really bad, you call me. Like, I think they respected the fact that, you know, I was willing to do what I asked of them. Um, and it was just a culminating moment for, for me, but also for us. And I think it helped us to really focus on getting back on what was important, which was getting the stadium built and, and kickoff for our first game in September. It's an incredible story. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. There are so many gems that you dropped in there. Okay, okay great. Like, like a leader needs a cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Wrote that down. Um, it's taxing. There's no other, that's the perfect word is when you're yeah. opening a venue or when you're running a venue um, and you're running 200 events a year, yeah. there are some breaking points, mm -hmm. right? And I think I love the story because, you know, you say, well, I, I realized in that moment that maybe I can just shed this idea that I need to be perfectly put together all the time because um, this team's coming in here and I can kind of even feel the weight lifting off of you in the story saying yeah. like, hey, wait a minute, like we're carrying this thing together. I don't need to yeah. carry this whole thing on my shoulders. So I love that story. And um, it, it's really, really powerful when you think about um, taking your first leadership role, you know, understanding that the team is part of the journey and that um, you have a role in leading them, but they are part of your leadership strategy as well. So I, I and that's really, what you want that you yeah. want, you want your team to, to feel like you're in it together, good times and bad times. And, I, and it's a, a mistake I made my very first management job, which was obviously years before that, but I led how I was led, which was be happy that you're in sports. Anybody is willing, I can name a thousand people right now. They're willing to take your spot. I'm doing this because we just have to generate revenue. And it was all about numbers. And I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that that was my first kind of mindset, my few months into um, leadership. 
but I quickly realized that I am not the past leader. I am me. And this is a new journey for me. Um, and you know, it's gotta be that, that camaraderie that you lean on and that partnership and teamwork that you lean on as cliche as it sounds, um, when times are tough. Absolutely. Um, I wrote down, you know, you evolved as a leader. That's big. Okay. Absolutely. Um, you adapted. And so each in each role that should be, what are you taking along with you? It's not just the skills that you picked up. It's not just the revenue you generated. It's, the leadership, the leadership skills, the lessons. Okay. And I think one other word that I have written down and underlined here is that is trust. Um, you know, such a big word when you are leading a team, you're doing something as involved and as heavy as opening (laughs) a stadium. Okay. At the professional level, that is going to be heavy taxing work. So being able to not only trust your team, but for them to know that, Mm-hmm. You know, it's clear to me that that was the case with you because, you know, of the way you tell that story and um, of how in that moment you're like, wait a minute, <laughs> what am yeah. I doing? Quick, yeah. throw this in the trash and rip it into a million pieces. Um, 100%. They never, <laughs> they never saw the letter. And again, I think if they, if any one of them are listening, I don't know that I've ever told them that story uh, because just, just in that moment, they snapped me back into like my body yeah. um, and <laughs> like, we went out, we went on about our day and then I was like, oh, okay, let's, let's get back to, to invoicing or whatever it may have been. Yeah. Yeah. That's really funny. Okay. So fast forward to today. Um, I want to talk about your approach, what's going on right now with you in Milwaukee. So your role is really, you know, overseeing and unifying the cross-functional teams, the departments within the greater organization. Um, what are some of the things that you're working on and what has your approach been so far, you know, to unifying those groups? Um, Well, I'll start with, with my approach. Um, I I mentioned this earlier, but I don't know everything. Um, And I think the sooner that I can let everyone in the room know that and know that I know what I don't know, um, I think the better folks feel um, about being empowered to do what they do best. Um, after that, the, the approach to unifying to me is having the right people. And, and of course the right people means the smart people and the people that are good at their job, but the right people also know that if you want to go fast, you go alone. And if you want to go far, you go together. Right. So it's as much as about the work that you're doing day to day, but your relationship with each other. Um, and I'm not sure how many people listening or watching played, team sports at any level, but business is very much like a team sport. Um, And that's also why I like to selfishly hire athletes because they just get it. Um, As cliche as it sounds, selling teamwork in is as important, if not more important than selling in a new project or a new idea or a new product. Um, So that's kind of my approach to thinking, one, as a leader, I need them to know that I trust you guys to do the work that's ahead of us, but how can we do it together? leaning on each other so that we can go as far as we need to go as a unit um, and not just being a siloed uh, siloed group with folks just focused on head down what they do from a day-to-day standpoint. Um, additionally, I think it's also important to celebrate successes, um, no matter how small they may appear um, when you're talking cross-functional, because honestly, just going back to the story I just told, uh, that could be the difference between someone having a good productive day and someone not. Uh, it could be the difference between somebody just saying I've had it um, or not. Um, so I guess that's my way of also saying as a leader, I think we need to be present. Uh, we need to pay attention and notice who is doing good work, uh, amplify it and acknowledge it. And it's, it's hard to do. I, I promise you, I, I came on board here two, three months ago and the only thing that I've been focused on primarily is ticketing because we got to get our business back and we're you know, having fans. But I sometimes have to take a step back to say, wait a minute, we just got fans in our building for the first time in almost a year. Let's celebrate and let's really focus on um, what's been great about the work that we've, we've been able to do. Um, and, and so I want to be clear that I'm not saying you should just give out participation trophies for every little thing because I hate participation trophies. You're either first, second, or third, and you really should want to be first, but that's another, that's another story for another day. But 
giving credit when you're on a project with cross-functional teams is hugely, hugely important. Um, and then to your question about what I'm focused on uh, back, like I just mentioned, right now we're still in a pandemic. Um, so growth and, and the things I came here to do um, in a traditional sense haven't been the highest priority as we're still trying to work to make sure that we have as many fans in the building as safely as possible. That said, I do think we will come out of this stronger and smarter as an organization. Um, so my focus from day one really is asking that question why. Um, understanding what areas of opportunity we can immediately assess using the pandemic almost as a reset button. Um, being smarter with data and automation and making sure it's the through line of our entire business. Um, expanding and monetizing digital content, which I know a lot of people are focused on. Um, rethinking just in general how we do stuff. How do we sell tickets? Who we sell them to? Are we selling them to the right people? Just asking questions and using the time we have now to be able to do things that maybe we haven't been doing, we haven't been able to slow down enough to really do. Um, so those are just a few things uh, that are on, on my plate, but it's exciting. And as I mentioned to you, I'm now uh, well, we've had three games in four days. So as, as much as I'm focused on the business side, I'm really excited to be a part of a winning team. Um, and having a, a brand new building still to celebrate. Uh, so more to come there. Absolutely. And, you know, you're buckling up and getting ready now for what we know as sports and entertainment and what we're all yep. very, very anxious to get back to. Absolutely. Um, but it's it's really, you know, a great point. And, you know, I hear this a lot too. I mean, the, this has given us all a chance to rethink strategy. And certainly mm -hmm. because of the contactless facet of, live events that will stick around. Um, I don't know for how long, um, right. but that's got to make everybody rethink their approach, um, yep. you know, in, in all things. So it, it's mm -hmm. a cool opportunity in that way for you to sit in the chair and say, okay, what did we learn in the past 12 months? And Absolutely. how do we predict that we can recover and yet innovate at the same time? Yeah. Okay. So my last question for you today, um, related to women in sports. So mm -hmm. you have been for a long time, a woman in prominent leadership in sports and entertainment with the NBA, your previous organizations, and now the Milwaukee Bucks and Pfizer Forum. In your opinion, how can pro sports teams and organizations embrace their responsibility? And I call it a responsibility because I believe it is as agents for change, particularly as it relates to normalizing women and minorities in the C-suite? I feel like we could have it's an entire, a an entire question, an entire uh, conversation about this an hours long. Um, couple things. I think as sports, we have eyeballs on us that wrong, right, or indifferent folks love their sports. They love for us to lead by example. So the first thing I would say is to be an example and lead from the front. Um, second thing, uh, be intentional in your hiring practices and don't just hire women in HR and as your chief diversity officer. Like, like really think about the role that women can play in your organization to make an impact. Hire them to lead your revenue generating departments because there's plenty of studies out there where it's shown, there's data showing that women are really good sellers and we are really good leaders. So it seems like a pretty easy solve for your diversity issues. So when you're talking about revenue generating departments, which we know lead to almost all the time to your team president level, to your team CEO level, be intentional on hiring women and minorities in those roles. Um, invest in your mid-level talent. So often we see the managers and directors and, you know, the I call them not yet um, as opposed to up and comers because to me, they're there in front of you. They have come to you. They're, they're there. They just have not yet had an opportunity to get that step that someone's going to take a chance on them. So invest in your mid-level talent and have conversations around what growth and development and transparently what it means, what transparency in getting to that next level means when you talk about hiring from within and growing from within. Um, and then lastly, this is something that leads to is, is almost tied to the previous about investing in mid-level talent is understand the unique challenges that working moms, as an example, face 
as they try to juggle family and work. So you could have an awesome star as a senior director or VP in your organization, but she may have, you know, just had a new baby or may want, may want to start a family. And she's trying to understand what am I going to have to give up? And yes, I agree. You can't have everything, but this to me is where inclusion comes in. Um, and it's not enough to just hire them into your organization. You really have to create and cultivate an environment in which women want to work there and feel comfortable that if they decide to make a choice to have a family, for an example, that they're not sacrificing their career. So as much as it is to hire diverse talent, I think it's also important to create an environment of belonging and inclusion as well. And, you know, you know, we've talked about this. I could go on and on and on and on uh, about this, to be honest, and I could easily get frustrated when it comes to seeing C-level roles being filled with non-diverse candidates in sports and, and in particular these days, sports adjacent businesses. So, you know, your sports tech companies and your SPACs. Um, and I don't want to sound like there's been no progress, of course, because I'm in the role that I'm in and I, I check quite a few boxes, but it's up to me and, and the few women that are at our level and at the C level to be advocates and not waste our voice when we're sitting at the table, um, not just be comfortable because we got here. And you don't want to ruffle feathers. Um, I had an interesting conversation with our exec team a couple of weeks ago where, you know, I put myself on the line with respect to a conversation around diversity, um, but it's not enough for us to just be successful in these roles. So maybe someone else gives another woman or another black woman or another queer black woman or another queer woman a chance. It's, it's up to us to really lead from the front and be advocates and vocal advocates when it comes to bringing in and creating an inclusive environment for diverse talent. Incredible. So I don't think that I could have answered that any better. <laughs> I mean, you hit everything. Great. Um, from not only the first step to the second and the third step. Yeah. Um, and it just, it creates a lot of, I'm starting to like ideate and come up with things like I love it. solutions. I mean, I know you saw Lisa Padilla's op-ed in mm -hmm. the SVJ. Um, I think that point was really well received uh, by the publication, you know, look outside your network. I think that's one of the biggest things that doesn't happen. And I don't necessarily yes. think it's intentional when it happens. It's something that is, a tr it's like been trained and it's just sort of like the way a lot of businesses operate is mm -hmm. I know this person, I'm just going to hire that person because I trust that person. Mm -hmm. I think maybe bringing a team approach and you know, the further along we get with the more diverse C-suite, the easier that becomes because if yeah. multiple people are making that decision and not just one. In a vacuum, well, it's, it's also easy. Like I am hiring for a few um, executive roles and looking at, you know, a few things as I'm here in Milwaukee and I'm not going to lie. It's easy because I know a lot of people in the industry and, and a lot of them are you know, not diverse candidates. So it would be easy for me as a leader with all the things that I have on my plate right now to be like, I don't have time to think about hiring. I don't have time to think about recruiting. I don't want to pay tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars to find you know, someone that's diverse. I get it. Like It's hard work. But with that hard work comes measurable impact to the business if you're successful in bringing in diverse talent. So the, the, the benefit far outweighs the challenges of actually having to dig in and, and look outside your network and take, take maybe the extra month it might take in a hiring process to say, how can I find the right person? And I just want to be very clear um, that we're not saying to hire diversity just for diversity's sake. So you can say you check the box, but there is great talent out in the market right now. And there always has been. You just have to look. Um, and it takes time to do that. So you have to say within your organization and to your leaders that I know it's easy to just say, you know what, I'm going to hire my buddy's friend or I'm going to hire somebody that I worked with 10 years ago or whatever it may be. But if it were easy, then everybody would do it. If you want to really be a great organization, to me, you have to put the work in to do things differently and also think differently. Absolutely. And the industry on the inside should be just as reflective of the reality on the outside. Okay. And, and it is 100%. harder. You make all of these valuable points, these really, really amazing points. 
Um, and maybe it is, it's, it's a little harder. It takes more time. And it's also mm -hmm. scary to try to find someone that you don't know and you yep. don't have their track record and you don't trust them. They didn't come from somebody, you know, who you trust. Right. So I think yep. that's a growth process in the industry, but it's taking a leap uh, mm -hmm. of faith and, and running with that instead of just, like you said, taking the easy way. So I think absolutely really powerful. Um, Thank could you. talk about this all day. Mm -hmm. but we'll, we'll cut ourselves off now and we'll save it okay. for another time. But I, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today, Raven. Um, of course. This is incredible stuff that I will share far and wide and, and hope that many, many people listen in and take something from it. Um, I'm going to close up by saying, you know, this has been a wonderful episode, episode nine. I'm looking forward to episode 10 next week with one of my good friends in the business, Caroline Savini, formerly Turnkey uh, Sports and Entertainment, a big executive recruiter in the business now with Activision Blizzard, Blizzard on the inside. Um, and finally, this interview was powered by WINS, our membership community for women influencing sports and entertainment. To learn more about us, visit us at wins.media slash membership. And thank you so much, Raven, for your time today. Thank you all, for having me. All that you do for women and minorities in sports and entertainment, incredible stuff. Thank you.